so much for joining me today. And we're going to get started with um, what we're doing. And my goal today is to answer some questions and bring awareness to some of the options that you have whenever you're going in to birth your baby, especially within the hospital setting. And we wanna make sure that you have that information so that you can make what I consider an informed decision, not just provide informed consent. You'll hear me say this over and over, it's a super, super important little foundational element that we have. Um, whenever you're in a hospital setting, a lot of times people may come up and say, or your staff will come in and give you a document, this is what we would like to do, uh, here, sign here. And what our goal is and what we desire for you is that you know what you are consenting to, what you're giving permission to be done to you, your body and your birth, as well as what's the, um, if any, what are the pros and cons. So a birth plan is just a document. Sometimes you'll have people who may encourage you to write one or not to write one. Where I'm at, it's a great tool of communication. They're not sure what your goals are, what it is that you are desiring and what you want. And so this is how we can communicate. And when you um, put it in paper and in writing, that also gives you the ability to not have to answer every single question. And then the staff can go ahead and take care of you and care for you immediately while you're waiting there. So you enter in, we have a document, it's written in paper, it has your desires on it. We're not saying that something needs to be not flexible. Flexibility is just a part of the way that labor may ebb and flow, but I definitely want you to have a great idea on what is in front of you. Um, I wrote notes so that I can make sure that we touch specific points. I'm not going to be able to cover a complete head to toe, top to bottom, start to finish birth plan, but we're just going to kind of hone in and expand and zoom in on some of the uh, interventions that have an impact on your ability to lactate, whether that's how it works or how it will delay um, our body from moving forward. So let me see, I am trying to get this other item on here. And let me see here. Let's see, I had a nice little message. <laughs> no, no, come back. <laughs> I'm just gonna have to leave stuff alone in a second. Um, let me start over because I lost everybody on Facebook. Okay, my daughter's gonna have a great time editing all of this video, so I'm glad that she has the ability and the know-how to assist. So we'll get that started again. All right, here we go. Um, some basic principles. What I want to understand. Um, I'm just saying and asking everybody to look at what we're going to discuss today in a different view, in a different light. Because sometimes whenever we change our perspective, then we get to see things. I'm not saying that the choices that you've made previously are incorrect. I'm saying that these are a way and some of the specific things to look at so that you can optimize what is happening and how you can move forward with, again, with what you're desiring. Um, all right, so our standard way of feeding our children, regardless of decisions, um, the gold standard is our liquid gold, our human milk. Your human milk is specifically designed specifically for your baby to come back into your own environment. Um, I know that there are things and complications that can happen and reasons where that might not be appropriate or have the ability to be able to sustain um, your baby, but we'll talk about some of those options. When you first going in into the hospital setting, one of the, uh, my goodness, hold on. <clears throat> okay, one of the 
common, most common interventions that they will do is offer fluids. What we know uh, with research is that a mom can hydrate appropriately during that time. We don't necessarily, when we are well, again, foundational principle, we're well. When we are well, then you have the ability to do that um, without needing IV fluids. A lot of times the hospital will ask to have access so that in a true emergency, they don't have to try and then place uh, a port to be able to provide you with medication or fluid to move forward. So a hep lock might be something that you consider. It has a catheter, it's almost just the hand port or the arm port. Again, gives them access, you're not hooked up to fluids. The way that the uh, IV fluids function in our body, they infuse a lot of our tissues. So most people who've gone and had a birthing event to where uh, they had either IV fluids, especially if there was an induction, the next few days they are really, really feeling as if they are um, a member of the Flintstones because you're so swollen. Well, all of that water also impacts our breast tissue and it tends to also engorge. Anytime our breasts are engorged, that can make it difficult, not only for the process of our body moving forward with changing hormonally, but it also increases the size of our breasts. And so then our little ones have a little difficulty. Um, breasts come in many, many sizes. The milk's not outward in that quote container. It doesn't matter whether you're an A all the way through an H, whether you have a smaller nipple, um, a really large nipple, there are ways that moms and babies work their way together and that lactation can take place. So if it's engorged, then that engorgement means that now we have to make some adjustments. Um, the adjustments are not impossible. Again, there's always a way. We're just talking about optimally. If you have the ability to hydrate yourself as well as nourish yourself during your laboring time, um, that is something to consider. Um, another very, very common, common issue is a synthetic hormone called Pitocin. And Pitocin is designed to have affect our small muscles and make the uterus, the smooth muscles, excuse me, and make the uterus contract. Many, many reasons why Pitocin might be something that you are offered. Um, if it is one of the issues to where you're needing to contract and have a baby, okay. If it is just standard protocol and practice, um, if we're trying to rush along, then those would be things to have some consideration. What Pitocin does, it has the same receptors in our bodies as after we've delivered our babies, we have a hormonal shift and that hormonal shift then increases in prolactin and the receptors in our body, the prolactin and the Pitocin kind of fight for that same one. We also know that Pitocin has a huge impact on our mental well-being. Um, it has research based been associated with having um, an increase in postpartum mood and anxiety disorders. So these are also points and conversations for you to have with your care provider to make sure that when you're having your appointments, you all are on the same page, you're having questions answered about this, and you can definitely do research. Um, an epidural, when we're looking at pain medications in a hospital setting, you are often uh, have the ability to have narcotics and also an epidural. We'll talk about narcotics really quickly. Uh, narcotics seem to be much more effective in the earlier stages and labor. If you have endured and you're to the point where you're getting ready and you're very close to pushing to get that baby into your arms and you ask for something, you might be told by the staff that you're so close. And the reason is, is that the narcotics will affect your baby. Remember, the whole time that you have been in your pregnancy, at no point have we ever said anything that you put into your body does not also go to your baby. We don't have any medication or technology that when you're in the laboring part to where um, 
we can say, okay, here's this medication and medication stay in the birther's body and not go to the baby. That just does not exist. And because it doesn't exist, it's one of those things that we have to be mindful of. If you got it later, a narcotic also affects the muscle tone of the baby and that overall aware awareness. And um, after our little ones are birthed, if you get direct skin to skin, and we'll talk about that in a second as well, then they have the ability to kind of acclimate and do that self-attachment. And so narcotics would affect their muscle tone to be able to root around, move their legs, and adequately get to where they're at, as well as their ability to suck. In order to suck, it takes a lot of muscles in our face. And so any medication that affects that um, will have an impact on your baby's ability. A famous video that is on uh, YouTube is self-attachment. And we did a big study on it, and they looked at babies who were birthed and placed on a mother's tummy. If they were unmedicated, then they kind of nestled and crawled on up and was able to effectively self-attach. Now, um, that's something that we try to encourage, regardless of where you're birthing. Um, and so we want to make sure that you have that ability to do that. An epidural gives you a longer coverage. You can have it a little bit later, but again, it still can affect the muscle tone of your little one. And so those are medications, again, not plus or minus, things to have conversation with, how close am I, um, how will this, this um, affect, do we have enough time to where you can get to the point where these tools and interventions are designed to affect change, and we will admit there are times that you have to affect change. And when that change is needed, then it's a balance and a scale. Uh, delayed cord clamping is um, when the baby has been born and has been placed skin to skin, uh, that cord continues to pulsate. And if you're watching, you may notice that in a different setting, that babies don't always cry immediately. It's not like what we see in Hollywood. And it's okay because that placenta that is internal is still working. And its job is to continue to provide oxygen as well as blood cells. One third of your baby's blood supply goes back and forth between your baby and that placenta. And as long as that cord is pulsating, they're adequately getting enough oxygen. We have a lot of research that says that that is very, very beneficial. It can help our little ones by returning on that um, red blood cells. Then it also can reduce the jaundice, not always increase jaundice. Jaundice, side asterisk, um, is when a baby is born, they have not been having bowel movements. One of the benefits of human milk is that it also helps babies to have those bowel movements. And the first poos are called meconium. They're very dark and tarry because it's just been sustaining your little one um, while you were carrying that baby. Well, there's a chemical inside that that is called bilirubin. And when we have, when you are providing that lactation, and for some reason we're not having enough as far as the input, then the meconium sits and it allows the baby's body to start reabsorbing. And that's when we can have a yellowing of the skin and the eyes. It can get to the point where um, it is a level that needs uh, to be addressed. But if we are feeding what we say on cue, a lot of people will say, a lot of our books say demand. I'm like, little ones don't demand. They just give us cues to let us know I need to eat now because everybody is learning how to do those things. But with the delayed cord clamping, um, once the cord has stopped pulsating, it usually will turn white. It becomes very, very flaccid. At that point, then we know our little ones have also received all of their one third of the blood supply or what they're needing. There's a lot of research that goes back in an out-of-hospital setting 
A lot of times um, under midwifery care, for example, that does not have a time limit. They're watching and waiting until it is sufficient. Within the hospital setting, we've had research that goes anywhere from it's okay and it's appropriate from 30 seconds to 60 seconds. So this would be something to kind of dive in, have some research, and then have um, a conversation with your care provider on that as well. Direct skin to skin. Direct skin to skin is direct. That means that your little person's tummy is directly onto your skin. And there are benefits that happen with that. Sometimes our little ones will have um, a covering called Burnix. And that Burnix is that white waterproofing. They've been living in a water area. They don't come out looking like uh, pruned little babies, so, which is really good. <laughs> it helps with bonding. <laughs> But anyways, um, when you do that direct skin to skin, they will need to dry your little one off, but they don't necessarily need to remove that vernix. Um, there are benefits to the baby having the ability to reabsorb. That's part of their first immune system. We have skin bacteria that is on us. When that baby goes here, you're already starting on their immune system. And the other benefits that you have is that they have that ability. Oh, there's that mommy's heartbeat and lungs. And they're going to respond by being very, very much calmer. Their breathing is going to become regulated so much quicker. One of the interventions that I'm noticing a lot is that staff will tend to put a heated, warmed blanket onto the birther's chest. Now, in my thinking, I don't have research that says this is effective. To me, it's one of those common sense that makes you kind of turn sideways. We are designed that we can effectively warm our babies better than the radiated uh, warmers that they have in a hospital setting. And to do that, we have direct skin to skin and our bodies will increase up to two degrees to effectively warm our little people. Well, if we've placed on a warmed blanket, that's signaling to our bodies, guess what? There's no need to warm. And then if we get a colder little one on us, then all of a sudden, we're gonna have a delay. So that's my personal little thing. Think about it, see where it is that you want. When we are talking about within the research, it is direct skin to skin that is beneficial. And you can still dry off a baby appropriately while baby is on the chest. Um, that awesome ability to increase I will say your partners also have that. Um, it's part of their endocrine system. We tend to regulate uh, a little bit more effectively those um, who uh, have uteruses will affect, <laughs> will kind of ebb and flow a little bit more. Um, usually on our males, they tend to get a little hot, don't warm off as much, but that's okay. You might notice that little person kind of raising an arm and everybody's usually trying to tuck it back down. And I just say, you know what, they're regulating. Baby is trying to regulate the amount of air and temperature that they need. It's like a little chimney. So it's okay for that arm to be out and so that you two can be together. Uh, let me see. As they are working to dry off your little one, see if you can reserve and for them not to dry off your baby's hands. On the hands, there's amniotic fluid where they've had, and we know that that is a marker to also trigger and be able to nurse. So little ones, along with going through these nine stages of transition, whether they're crying, they're looking, they're, you know, tongue thrusting, they're putting their hand to their nose and their mouth, they're smelling that amniotic fluid, and that all works together as part of a, a reflex to get them up there to be able to self-attach. Little ones will also, with their hands, kind of move around in the breast, and then we say that they're doing a scent marking, um, and that's something that will help within your uh, journey of providing human milk to your baby um, as well. Babies have a wonderful ability to get there, um, to get up to the breast area to go ahead and latch. We've had a lot of research where we also have people who um, can be very, very, what word do I want? Mindful of the time, let's say that. 
Um, we have a lot of research that says we have a golden hour. We have an expectation that babies will be able to self-attach within that hour. But again, we have to at times also be mindful of what we've done through that birthing process. If we've had any pain relief, then we know that that can be delayed as well. So then we'll have to um, allot that time. Once they get there, they don't need assistance as far as opening wide, as far as where's their tongue, as far as trying to shove, <laughs> for lack of a better word, a breast into that little person's mouth. Um, give them a chance. They're gonna acclimate around. They'll be around the breast. You'll see that tongue resting. You'll see them open. They'll get there and um, be able to attach the next day. That's when we kind of work on that uh dance for the dyad as i say because now we're sitting up we have gravity we need assistance and positioning it's very very different from staying and remaining flat to where you don't have gravity um, all of our research has kind of said no matter the size of the mountain the little one can get there so we just try and be patient i often encourage my clients to put their hands down by feet or partners to put their hands down by their feet and so as they are pushing off, they have something to push off on to go ahead and make the journey for that crawl to get on up. Um, I have basically covered most of the interventions that are seems to be something that is very common within the United States. If you have any questions, let's say from our little Zoom, Feel free to either type something in if you have a question. Um, I had some difficulty, which I apologize. So we will get this uploaded as soon as we can to all of the social media areas that we had. And you are more than welcome to ask any questions. Um, most of the things that I did cover today are our recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, which is AAP. ACOG is your American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. That is the club and kind of the hub for our um, OBs. It is also from the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. So the only opinion that I've given you today was my hot blanket one. Everything else is absolutely backed by research and we can provide that to you. And I'm more than happy to add that. I'll go back and add that into the comments so that you can also have that. You're not going in and having a conversation with your care provider. Hey, I listened to the Zoom or Miss Danielle said. Um, I want you to be able to at least be able to have a conversation on your own desires. And if you need additional information, uh, I'm more than happy to show you where that research is. It has been an absolute pleasure sharing this time with you. I'm gonna get all the social media stuff down soon. <laughs> and we will definitely be able to get it figured out. And um, I apologize for that delay. Does anybody that is on currently the Zoom have any questions, Ruth or Bailey? I know Bailey is working. She's in and out. So Ruth, I know you're seasoned. Anything that you feel needs to be covered or have a question? You all are muted. You'd have to unmute. Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. It's been a pleasure. Those items, again, that you're going to uh, be mindful of are IV fluids, um, pain medication, Pitocin. Up, oh, I do have a question. Wonderful, very good. We will get those links up there. That won't be a problem. Um, cord, delayed cord cutting and or clamping. Your direct skin to skin is also on there. Amniotic fluid on hands. And then as a bonus, I will also add on in the information of the nine transitional stages that our little people go to. I will say this. One of the things that um, has been noted is during those nine transitional stages, work really, really hard to keep that baby's belly to your belly. What happens is we tend to come out and then people are doing the jobs that they need. And APGAR is a first 
assessment of a little one and we're checking on the transition on how they're making uh, the transition from being first off uh, liquid breathers to oxygen and regulating. And so there are things that your uh, baby person will come over and look at. Um, that can be done without them having to remove the baby from your chest. If they need access to the chest, um, if they need access to your baby's chest to listen to the breathing or the heart rate, keep your hand on your baby's belly and just kind of turn to the side. Sometimes what we've noticed is that when babies are completely removed, they kind of set, settle back in and start back at stage one of those nine transitional stages, which obviously will lengthen the time, which obviously will might mean that we go past an hour. Uh, for those that are having surgical births, I will say this, there are a lot of providers and a lot of hospital systems now that are um, trying to facilitate skin to skin in the OR. If so, take advantage of that. If for some reason that is impossible, then I encourage you to have your partner do skin to skin. We've had some times when um, we had separation um, that was absolutely medically necessary. When that little person can have skin to skin with the partner, uh, that voice that they've been hearing that whole time, it's really, really great. When you have skin to skin, it is raising your baby's blood sugar, which is very important. It's something that, again, that their bodies are going to have to start regulating now that they have transitioned to life in your arms. Um, but that skin to skin is a great go-to. Uh, well, then by the time uh, the lactator comes back, we can put baby on chest and even with that interruption, we can get there. So interruption and, and having the process where in a non-emergent um, non what's the word I want? Um, time, we're just gonna say time because I lost my word. Um, if it's not emergent and if we can keep the dyad together, then we're gonna have optimal outcomes. We do know that separation does have an impact. Surgical birth has an impact. We have that expectation that after you birth, that your chemical and your hormones are gonna switch over and the, uh, your body is going to, to start changing from colostrum, which is amazing. And it's that first food. And the colostrum is gonna change over to what we call mature milk or lactogenesis too. It's thinner and more copious. We have that expectation that when uh, somebody will birth and they birth in a low interventive setting, but that takes place between days three and five. If there's a surgical birth, you can imagine most of the things, if we have a surgical birth, we've already gone through all of these interventions, majority of them will be given. It can be delayed up to 10 days. Uh, that still doesn't mean that your colostrum is not adequate frequent, frequent, frequent sessions of letting that baby remove milk is the way to increase your supply. Um, to make more milk, we remove the milk that we have. So again, I think that is it for today. Um, if you would like more information, then you can visit my website. It is Agape Jula Surface. I am Danielle Legrand. I'm an advanced certified birth doula and advanced certified postpartum doula, a Lamaze childbirth, certified childbirth educator, as well as a certified lactation counselor. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And of course, the latest that I'm working on is I'm a midwifery student, almost completed um, working toward my CPM, which is becoming a certified professional midwife. If you need any additional information or would like to schedule an appointment or consultation for uh, services, just let me know. My cell is 405-819-4904. Thank you so much again for your time. It's been a pleasure. We'll see you later. Thanks everybody for joining. Thank you, Nathaniel. You're welcome. You're welcome.